that you'd help us to share the good news of all that you've done in reconciling us to yourself. God, we give you thanks and praise for all that you're doing in the life of our church. God, we thank you as we enter back into this school year schedule, God, and get back into the rhythm of, of normal life. God, you'd help us. We're grateful for all that you're doing. We're grateful for the children of our church, the youth of our church, the adults of our church. God, would you continue to use us Help us to carry your good news with us wherever each day takes us, that when people interact with us, when they see us, they would see Jesus. Do the work in us that you need to do to continue to form the image of Jesus in us. As we come to your table later on in the service, God, would you fill us afresh with your grace and your love that you poured out so richly and freely on the cross. God, we love you. We thank you. We give you our very selves today in worship. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to continue to worship, and I invite you to, uh, to stand as we sing. By Christ, we are His, and we call Him Father, and He calls us our own. We are children of God, and we are free. Yes, so will you sing this with us? Praise in whatever you way, and if whatever way you're comfortable. And those of you online, if you can stand, if you are able, and sing with us. I'm a child of God.
feel so good this morning to say, I am chosen, doesn't it? We know that it is and that we come with what we come with and he is right there. And before he knew it, he knew on that cross what he was doing. And at that, claw, at that cross, he can't speak today. At that cross today, that's where we find our hope. That's where we find our peace and our comfort. And that he is there with us. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and seated. Our scripture reading this morning, because we are still in our series, the Songs of Summer, and so we are reading a psalm today. Uh, psalm chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. 
Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan, encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring it to a people yet unborn. He has done it. This is the word of God for us today. I hope you don't mind that we've read so much scripture in our worship here today. I believe there's something powerful that happens when we hear the word of God together. What? Oh, yeah, sorry. That would be my wife. The kids are uh, dismissed to go to Children's Church uh, with Miss Ruth Marie, and they are grateful. They wish I had done that before I read that psalm. But uh, it's been one of those mornings. I even forgot to buy the communion bread this morning, so Will ran out during Sunday school and, and bought the communion bread for us this morning. Thanks for that, Will. Um, Yeah, that's that's all I got. Um, Have you ever ever heard or sung this song? How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. 
His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Have you ever sung that song before? Do you know it? It's, it's a beautiful song that speaks of God's love for us and about how sh- God showed us that love by putting on our humanity and suffering in our place, dying for our sin. And I want to love this song with its beautifully poetic depiction of, of one of the pictures of how God atoned for our sins and, and what was accomplished by Christ on the cross. But I get held up by one line in particular, one line that, that never quite sat right with me. The line I'm referring to says, How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away. And the idea that God the Father turned his face away from Jesus, who is God the Son, while he suffered on the cross, dying for our sin, accomplishing the plan that God had established from the very beginning to reconcile humanity to himself. It always seemed like some kind of division or separation or brokenness within the triune God, the God who has revealed himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one being. And I could never quite reconcile the idea of God turning away from God while still maintaining the unity of being that defines the Trinity. I couldn't understand how God the Father could be separated from God the Son and our salvation still be accomplished. After all, did did any of the four Gospels actually say that this is what happened? I don't think so, and all the times I've read them. But what we do see in the Gospels, particularly in Mark and in Matthew, is this cry from Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it wasn't until I read a book by Tom McCall, who previously taught at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and now teaches at Asbury Theological Seminary. His book is entitled Forsaken, The Trinity, The Cross, and Why It Matters. And the argument that Tom lays out in his book helped me to understand the dissonance that I was feeling about that line in the song. But it also gave me a different framework in which to understand this cry of abandonment that Jesus uttered from the cross. And this is where the crucifixion narrative connects with our summer series about the Psalms. You see, when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't just a cry of abandonment or desperation, or as theologians and Bible scholars refer to it, the cry of dereliction. There's a word you can use this week and get a gold star. Dereliction. So it wasn't just this cry of abandonment. It was, as you may have already put together by this point in the service, a direct quote from Psalm 22 verse 1. Now, one way to read that would be to say that Jesus was quoting that specific verse because it was familiar to him and it shows how deeply steeped in the Hebrew scriptures he was. And that one verse expressed what Jesus was experiencing in that moment on the cross. 
So that verse was what Jesus was referencing. And, and that was all that was relevant to his experience. But another way to read it, which I think makes a lot of sense, is to read Jesus' cry in Mark and Matthew as a reference not only to verse 1 of Psalm 22, but to the whole of Psalm 22 in its entirety. I mean, think, and I think it makes sense, think with me for a moment about the very next psalm, Psalm 23, which Will preached on a few weeks ago. If I say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, where does your mind go? Right? You continue reciting that psalm in your mind, even if you don't say it out loud. I'm guessing many of you could say it out loud. He makes me lie down in green pastures, right? Say it with me. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It just comes pouring out of us. When we hear those opening words, for those of us who have, who have hidden those words in our heart, like Psalm 119 tells us to. So whenever we hear the words, the Lord is my shepherd, we hear whatever comes next in the context of the whole of Psalm 23, in the context of the good shepherd who provides and protects and guides and blesses. So I think it's entirely plausible that this is exactly what Jesus intended when he cried out, quoting from Psalm 22, 1. He meant for the people who heard him to start thinking about Psalm 22 as a whole. You know, so many of those Jews, these were, these were their hymns, right? These were the hymn book of the Jewish people, and, and they sang them, they knew them, they were part of who they were. And so, for them to hear Psalm 22, 1. They started to think about all that came next. And, and so Jesus wanted them to interpret what was happening to him, what he was doing there on the cross in light of what the rest of the psalm says. And I think Mark and Matthew following him did that very thing. I think it's clear from some of the phrasing that they use and the, the connections and allusions that they make throughout the crucifixion narrative, tying it back to Psalm 22. Listen to some of these connections and judge for yourself. Don't just take my word for it, but see if you hear the connection here. Psalm 22, verses 6 to 8. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their head. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Now compare that to Matthew 27, starting in verse 39. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads, and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. And notice, in particular, verse 43. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Or, or take, for instance, Psalm twenty two sixteen. 16. It says, they pierced my hands and my feet. And while there's not a direct quote of this verse, that is what was meant by crucifixion. Your hands and your feet were pierced by nails that held you to the cross until you died. 
Or take, for instance, Psalm eight, or verse 18 of Psalm 22. They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. It says the same thing in Matthew 27, 35. When they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. John 19, 24 makes it explicit that this was to be understood in light of Psalm 22. Let's not tear it, they said in John 22, uh, verse 18. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. To me, it's clear that the writers of the Gospels recognized the connection between Jesus' death and Psalm 22, among other Old Testament passages that they quote. So, what I, what I want to get to is, if, if Jesus and the Gospels intend for us to understand Jesus' crucifixion and death in light of the whole of Psalm 22, what does the rest of Psalm 22 say, and what does that add to our understanding of what Jesus was accomplishing in his death on the cross? There's a few more key verses in Psalm 22. Don't worry, I'm not going to work through all the rest of Psalm 22 verse by verse. But there's a few key verses that I want us to focus in on. The psalm we mentioned begins with this feeling of rejection and abandonment. But that's not where it ends up. As is often the case, it takes a turn at some point. At some point, there's a pivot that shifts from the present circumstances that the psalmist is experiencing to a view of what God has done and what God is doing. And I think there's the same kind of shift that takes place here in Psalm 22 in verse 19 with the little word, but. Psalm 22, verse 19. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. But that little word that shifts everything. And there's this recognition that in the midst of all all the things that have been described up to this point in Psalm 22, that God is still near to us. And he is still our strength. And that was true for the psalmist, and it was true for Jesus. I believe it's true for us. Now, it doesn't mean that God pulled Jesus down off the cross and rescued him from the suffering that he was experiencing. But God was still with him, and he could have done it. If he had chosen to, he was able to take Jesus down off that cross. But God the Father did not abandon Jesus entirely. Yes, he's forsaken Jesus to his death at the hands of sinful men, but God has not forsaken Jesus in his sufferings. So we read in Psalm 22, verse 24, For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. That's Jesus, the afflicted one. He has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Even as Jesus bore the weight of our sin, the Father didn't turn his back on the Son, and there was no rupture in the being or relationship of the Trinity. The God who put on flesh and died for us and our salvation is the same God who suffered. Our salvation was accomplished not by an act of God the Father against God the Son, but through the triune God dealing with our sin. So Luke tells us in chapter 23 that Jesus called out with a loud voice, 
He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And John records Jesus' final victorious cry. John says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. These are not the cries of someone who has been utterly forsaken, but of one who is looking beyond the present moment, someone who understands that to heal humanity, his ascent must begin from the very lowest point of human experience. So he descended even to death, so that in his ascent, humanity could be raised with him. I believe Jesus had not only these opening words of Psalm 22 on his mind as he hung on the cross, when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But I believe he had the closing words on his mind as well. All the ends of the earth, verse 27 says, will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow before him. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. He has done it. Like Jesus said, it is finished. He accomplished our salvation once and for all there on the cross. And as we move into the celebration of Holy Communion this morning, we celebrate the victory that Christ won on our behalf. And we celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus made to make us whole. We proclaim as Paul said, the Lord's death until he comes again. And we celebrate that if God didn't forsake Jesus as he bore our sin and shame there on the cross, we can believe his promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Would you pray with me this morning? God, how grateful we are that you were willing to come laying down all of your rights and privileges as God to die in our place, to suffer for us, to redeem us, to pay the price for our sin and our rebellion to be mocked and scoffed at so that you could bring us back to God. And so we recognize today, God, that we are part of those who have been gathered from the ends of the earth and who proclaim even to this day, God has done it. It is finished. And we can trust you, God. We can trust that you'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. Just as you never forsook your son, even as he hung there on the cross. So as we come to your table this morning, as we remember and proclaim Christ's death, we remember that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we're called to proclaim that good news to a lost and dying world. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the invitation to the Lord's table this morning. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Would you pray with me this prayer of confession? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. 
We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, Father, and he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, Father. Gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of knowing that we are the children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, I'm going to invite those who are assisting with communion to come take their places here at the front.
Christ shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. I'm going to invite you to come to exit your pew to the left, to come down the aisle and receive the communion elements from uh, those who are assisting us today. And then you can either take the elements and kneel at the altar. You can return to your seats with them. You can take them as you go, um, however you feel like you'd like to receive the elements this morning. Um, and if you're unable to come and receive the elements down here and you'd like someone to bring them to you um, when once one of the sections has finished, if you'll just slip up your hand, someone will come and bring you the elements. Okay? Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground when the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. For this man who needs amazing kind of grace, for forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay, I'm not perfect, though I thank God every day. There was Jesus. There was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been, you to stand. We're going to sing as we close our service in just a moment, uh, but let's pray together. 
God, we're grateful. We're grateful for your grace poured out in our lives, for your love so freely and richly given to us. Thank you for meeting us here at your table. Thank you for making us a part of your body. Help us to be the body of Christ broken and poured out for a world that desperately needs to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you remain standing as we sing our closing song? I am not alone. Brothers and sisters, you're not alone. 
He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He showed us that in his love for us, shed abroad in our hearts on the cross. So receive this benediction as you go this morning. Peace to you, brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. God bless you all this week.